bloodletting. The very word conjures images of cruelty and sacrifice. Beginning over 3,000 years ago, patients were bled to death in their thousands. Ancient doctors removed up to four pints in a bid to cure everything from fever to madness. It does sound outrageous to, to open the veins and, and drain somebody of their life-giving fluid, but in some circumstances it can actually be beneficial. Bloodletting's most famous practitioner hailed from ancient Greece, and his name was Galen. Born in 129 AD, he was to become worshipped as a god for his miraculous healing powers. Galen had a, a theory uh, of medicine that was based on balancing humors uh, throughout the body. And uh, he assumed that uh, in order to get the right balance of humors, if you let out blood, then the humors balance themselves. A chilling array of tools were used to open up his patients, from hooks and scalpels to knives and cutting machines. The most notorious of all was the leech. I think most patients today, seeing uh, leeches on their body, would throw up their hands in horror as it being an outmoded form of treatment. Um, but it has undergone a resurgence. Galen's theories, along with the use of leeches, have been dismissed for centuries. But now, recent evidence has caused medical science to reevaluate them. At the Ancient Discoveries Laboratory, leeches expert Carl Peters is investigating the leech's blood-sucking powers. In, in this uh, small uh, vial here, we have uh, just some uh, ordinary sheep's blood, and on the bottom we have some collagen membrane. So we'll put the leech on, on the bottom there, and, and then hopefully it'll, it'll drain, the, it drain the, the vial. Over 20 minutes, the leech sucks the blood from the vial multiplying its body weight by up to four times. The question remains, how could this phenomenal sucking power be used to save lives? For a window into how ancient leechcraft worked, Ancient Discoveries has brought in a human guinea pig, former military officer David Shaw. Dave is about to feed these miniature carnivores with their food supply for the next six months. I'm not a fan of needles at the best of times and the leech is like a little biological needle I suppose but he's got about 300 teeth or so they tell me so yeah a little bit anxious a little bit nervous Carl attaches the leech to Dave's calf it begins by flexing to increase body volume and prepare for drinking up to 50 milliliters of human blood after 25 seconds the leech breaks the skin when it makes the hole, it bites in. It's got three, three jaws, 125 teeth on each jaw. Normally, when the skin's surface is broken, a blood clot forms to prevent us from bleeding to death. Here we see the leech's three jaws. Leeches have a unique substance that overrides the body's clotting mechanism, their saliva. This acts as an anticoagulant, which prevents the blood from clotting. In the ancient's procedure, as now, the leech falls off once it's had its fill of approximately two ounces of blood. It was quite an experience. It, um, it surprised me the number of times that you actually felt a little sharp uh, prick, and apparently the, uh, the leech uh, is not happy with just one bite of the cherry. He likes to dig a bit deeper and find uh, the optimum blood supply. You can feel the, uh, the bodily contractions of the, of the leech as he uh, kind of ingested the blood, but you couldn't feel a flow. Now begins the second part of the ancient procedure. Most of the blood wasn't removed by the leech itself, but from the unclotted bleeding caused by the leech's saliva. Once the leech feeds, because of the anticoagulants in the area, it'll sort of help the area decongest and the hole it makes will still bleed for about 10 hours so you've got the blood into the artery and out of the, the hole leech is made so it's keeping the area alive long enough for the body to repair. These limbs are suffering from a septic necrosis which is caused by a lack of blood supply and bone death. A condition seen on the battlefields of ancient Greece due to sword and axe wounds. As the blood vessels are severed Limbs are deprived of critical nutrients in the blood, resulting in amputation or death. The leech's saliva contains agents that vasodilate the small veins and capillaries in the flesh. 
This allowed ancient leeches to draw the blood evenly through damaged flesh, keeping it alive while it healed. Yet leeches were not the only skin-crawling critter to inhabit the world of ancient gruesome medicine. The most shocking treatments of all came from poisonous snakes. In Greece lies the ruins of Epidaurus, headquarters of a mysterious ancient snake cult said to have magical healing powers. It was founded in 300 BC by a demigod whose name was Asclepius. The cult of Asclepius was, was very important in, in ancient Greece and people would flock from all over Europe to visit him and to receive his wisdom and his healing and his diagnostic powers. Asclepius's symbol of healing was a snake. There is the fable of the snake bringing the herbs of life and it is thought that his symbol of the staff with the single snake coiled round it arises from that story. Asclepius's snake potions were said to have the power to revive the dead. For 2300 years they have been dismissed as myth. Now modern science may provide clues as to how the snake potion worked. The Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in England houses over 200 of the world's most poisonous snakes. Dr. Rob Harrison is one of the foremost experts on the medical effects of snake venom. In order to make a snake potion, the ancients would have needed to milk the venom. Our subject is the horned viper, one of the most dangerous snakes in the world. Venom extraction is a, is a dangerous procedure. It should only be done by experts. It's important when I'm helping Paul milking the snakes that we're not scared, but that we feel competent. Anxious is all right, scared is not all right. The horned viper is native to northern Africa, and just half of its maximum dose is enough to kill an adult. If a person was bitten, they could uh, you know, be in a life-threatening situation within 20 minutes, half an hour. Okay, Paul, are you ready? Yeah. As Dr. Harrison and his snake handler, Paul, extract the poison, they are replicating a process carried out by the ancient snake handlers. Once the snake is trapped, the handlers place its jaws over the edge of a beaker and force the venom into the beaker's bottom. Modern research supports the idea that a snake potion would have had certain benefits. The neurotoxins can be used to create drugs that treat Alzheimer's and memory loss, and its hemotoxins help combat heart disease and high blood pressure. 125,000 people die every year from snake bite. High blood pressure certainly kills many more people than that. And the ACE inhibitors, which are the most effective drug against high blood pressure, were developed from snake venom proteins. So we should look at snakes not just as enemies, but also as potential contributors to our better health. If the ancients did access the same unique properties of snakes as modern medicine, how did they ingest the venom in the first place? Amazingly, they may have drank it. Drinking lethal snake venom is not fatal, unless there are cuts in the digestive system allowing the venom access to the bloodstream. 2,300-year-old accounts tell of Asclepius's patients drinking from the head of a snake-covered gorgon and then developing the power to heal. Tantalizing evidence that the ancient Greeks could have discovered the same healing powers as the 21st century's latest medical drugs. The ancients' unrelenting search for new medical treatments even saw them transform an underwater killer's taser-like weapon into a miracle cure. The secrets had been lost to time. Until now. Since the beginning of history, humans have sought to manipulate and control pain. From ancient torture devices that inflict unimaginable suffering, to magical ointments that make pain disappear. The fact that we want to get rid of pain is not new. I'm sure the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, and probably everybody who went there before them didn't want pain either. Today, 
When we think of pain relievers, we think of aspirins or morphine. But in 100 AD, the Romans discovered a very different solution to pain relief. A secret lost to history that depended on a terrifying denizen of the deep. Roman historian Plutarch left an account describing an incredible pain neutralizer, a rare kind of electric eel known as a torpedo. The ancient Roman sources describe how sufferers of extreme joint and leg pain were taken down to the beach. Here, their feet were placed directly on top of the torpedo. After time, their suffering abated and their pain disappeared. The Roman accounts tell of how the torpedo could be used to cure almost all pains, from stomach cramps to syphilis. But aside from the basic ancient descriptions, nothing is known about how the treatment actually worked. How does the jolt of a dangerous animal relieve pain? At the Finisterre Aquarium in La Coruña, Spain, torpedoes are being scientifically examined for the first time. Fernanda Miguelas is a marine scientist who has long been fascinated by the fish whose deadly electric shock weapon may have the power to heal. It's a fish that has remained mysterious for centuries because it primarily lives undercover on sandy beds, hidden from human eyes. The torpedo's electric discharge is primarily for defense, but it is also used to kill prey. When in an attack mode, the torpedo electrocutes its target fish, paralyzing it before swallowing it whole. To unravel the mysteries of the torpedo, the fish's deadly electric charge must first be quantified using the latest scientific techniques. To do this, the team need to move the torpedo to the laboratory's test center. Two millennia after the Romans discovered the torpedo's electric powers, modern science can now reveal how the electricity is produced. Two electric organs each containing over 1,000 cells, form the torpedo's electrical power station. When the torpedo stings, the brain signals for the cells to fire, and an electrical charge is produced. Each of the cells produces a small quantity of electricity, but the combination of many cells, all acting in unity, generates an exceptionally powerful electrical discharge. The result is a living aquatic taser. This machine here is an oscilloscope. We use it to measure the torpedo's electric discharge. It measures the voltage of the charge in relation to time. Today, we are going to measure the highest electric charge that it is possible for the torpedo to produce. Torpedo is Latin for paralyzed, so Fernanda must take great care when handling the fish during the test. <laughs> The torpedo fires its electric bolt, which registers